We've spent several weeks in this section of 1 Corinthians. Here Paul's addressing the use of spiritual gifts and specifically here in chapter 14, the problem of speaking in tongues that the Corinthians had brought into the church from their culture that surrounded them. He has through much of the book uh, in the previous 13 chapters some of the things we've learned so far that I want to review today before we go on to new material will help us because we live in a culture where many of these principles in chapter 14 in our Christian culture, even in Polk County, are being ignored. And we have to make sure we're getting a, a grip on them. The first of these in review uh, that we went through last week is that spiritual gifts were given for the benefit of the body and the edification of the body. They're given for the benefit of the body and edification of the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The Holy Spirit, when we're saved, we've learned that He gives us spiritual gifts. Those spiritual gifts are not for personal edification. They're for the benefit of the rest of the body. So there's ramifications to that. If I choose not to gather with the rest of the body, then my spiritual gift is not going to benefit the rest of the body. If I try to use my gift to benefit myself, I'm misusing it. It is for the profit of all. A second principle we've learned is that gifts were given at the sovereign direction of the Holy Spirit. This was actually back in chapter 12. We learned in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. And then verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. So whatever the gift is, it was given at the sovereign direction of the Holy Spirit. And gifts were also given in a diversified way. So there should be no favoritism or jealousy over the gifts. We won't read, reread through 1 Corinthians 12, 17 to 26. You can read through there. Some people were all excited that they had a better gift than someone else. And they're saying, well, your gift is worth nothing. The gifts were diversified for the help and the benefit of the whole body. The fourth thing we've learned about gifts is gifts were to be performed in love. Paul spent a whole chapter or a majority of a chapter 13 dealing with the priority of love in our ministry. It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. For though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Whatever gift you try to perform outside of biblical love, it will not be effective for what it's intended to do. And the fifth principle we've learned is that the gift of tongues was and is not proof of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. And all do not have the gift of tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, for all have been made to drink in one Spirit. Every individual who has put their faith in Jesus Christ is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So we don't have to look for another sign. If we've put our faith in Christ, we're already baptized in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 30 said, do all have a gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The implication is no. We were all given different gifts. So as we remind ourselves of those principles, we're going to continue on in verses 20 to 40 and see several other principles that deal with how the body is to be edified using the different gifts. The first point we need to look at is tongues was given as a sign to unbelievers. Tongues was given as a sign to unbelievers. 
The Corinthians here, as we look at verse 20, says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. He says, there's some things you need to understand here. You need to grow up. They needed a proper understanding of the gift of tongues in particular. And they needed less understanding of participation in sin. They were doing well with their selfishness and the way they were attacking others. They needed less of that. It had already been noted by some that they had manifested nearly all the elements of the flesh as listed in Galatians 5, 19-23. They didn't need any more help with sin. They had done this because of the self-focused use of their gifts. They were not ministering to one another as they should have, and the body of Christ was hurt and hindered instead of being built up. John MacArthur, as he spoke of, of this subject, he says, They were not interested in truth, but in experience. Not in right doctrine or right living, but only in good feelings. They were not interested in pleasing the Lord or their fellow Christians, but only themselves. Experience always won out over truth. Emotions always ramp one out over reason. And self-will always won out over God's will. Unlike the Bereans in Acts 17, the Corinthians didn't bother to check what they heard against the Scriptures. They did not bother to test the spirits to see where they were from. If something sounded good, they believed it. If it felt good, they liked it. Like the Israelites in the time of the judges, everyone did evil, or everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 17. So tongues, first of all, uh, is a sign to unbelievers. And as we look at the passage, we better understand that. In verse 21, it says, In the law it is written with all men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak of this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. For the tongues are, are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So the sign is for unbelievers. Now, wait a minute. As you look at the rest of the passage, it talks about unbelievers being confused and not understanding. So to get a glimpse of what he means when it says it's a sign for unto believers, we need to look back and figure out why is Paul going to Isaiah 28 and quoting this passage? What sign is there to unbelievers? Well, it's a sign of the coming discipline or judgment of God upon his chosen people, Israel. See, Paul goes back to this text in Isaiah 28. In the context here, Isaiah is telling the people of the coming destruction upon Israel because of their unfaithfulness. And he's telling them with that coming destruction, people of foreign languages will be taking over your land and you will hear these fallen foreign tongues that you don't understand. Yet the people would not listen. In fact, if you look back to Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10, Isaiah was making it as clear as you can. Some of you are familiar with these verses, if you're familiar with K. Arthur's Bible studies, because this is the theme verse of her studies. Uh, he says, Whom will teach the knowledge, and who will make to understand the message? Those just wean from milk, those who draw from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest to which you may cause a weary the rest. And this is the refreshing, yet that they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be caught and snared and caught. Isaiah had taken little bitty pieces to them that they would understand, and yet they would not listen. If you look at the first part of Isaiah, it was prophesied, you go preach and nobody's going to listen. But he made it simple. And here, he's speaking that these people of foreign language are going to destroy Israel. And see, nearly eight centuries before this, Moses had prophesied of a nation that would conquer them in Deuteronomy 28. He says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flies, a nation whose languages you will not understand. 
He had told of the curses back in Deuteronomy 28. Isaiah reminded them of them. And those of Isaiah's time would see the destruction of the northern kingdom. And then a hundred years later, Jeremiah prophesied in a like way in Jeremiah 5.15. It says, Behold, I'll bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation, it's an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. See, for the Jews who understood the Old Testament and the prophecies and the history they would have understood that when he's speaking about people coming and speaking in foreign languages, that God had prophesied judgment, and that was one of the signs of his judgment. God had truly judged the northern tribe of Israel in 722 B.C. Assyria came in and destroyed. Then in 586 B.C., God disciplined Judah in the same way. The temple was torn up, or not at this point, but uh, God would certainly therefore bring judgment on Jerusalem. See, the people had their Messiah come to them. Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. And the children of Israel rejected him. And as they rejected him, indeed, judgment would come. And in AD 70, the Roman general Titus completely wiped out Jerusalem, including the temple. Jesus had prophesied himself of this destruction in Luke 19. He says, they'll level you and your children with you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. After the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, the reason for tongues had ceased to exist. The judgment, which it was a sign, had come. After Pentecost, manifestation of tongues, remember, Peter reminded his hearers of this judgment. In Acts 2, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus you crucified. Israel had rejected their Messiah, and judgment would come. So first of all, Paul says, it is a sign of a judgment or a curse upon the people. But within that judgment or curse upon the chosen people, there was also a, a sign of blessing. And this is secondary to that, because as God brought judgment on Israel for rejecting his son, Jesus Christ, he was in the process of building his church. And his church would come from all nations, tribes, and tongues. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. In Romans chapter 11, we learn that salvation came to the Gentiles because of the hardening of Israel. So you have the curse that it's a sign of, primarily to unbelievers, but secondarily, it's a sign of blessing that God is opening the door for the Gentiles. A third way tongues was a sign was that it was validation to the apostles and the prophets of the message of judgment and blessing that they would bring to the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now as we think about this being a sign of a coming judgment and is there still need for a sign today, let's illustrate this with the idea that when we go back to Illinois, go back home, visit family, as we travel, we might see a sign that says, St. Louis, 300 miles. And later we might see a sign that says, St. Louis, 150 miles. And eventually, St. Louis, 10 miles. But as we travel on to my parents, 30 miles beyond St. Louis, we don't see signs for St. Louis anymore. Why? We're beyond it. So as the judgment would come, the need for tongues would be gone. As Paul continues in this passage, not only was sign primarily, uh, the tongues was a sign primarily for unbelievers, but he, he goes on and he says, uh, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but those who believe. So prophecy was and is for believers. Believers. 
the proclamation of God's truth so that individuals might be edified. We've previously stated that though some of the prophecy at the time of the Corinthians was revelatory and would edify, today the revelatory aspects of the gift are gone. But we still, today, we have the entire word of God to proclaim as God has revealed his truth and we proclaim the truth of his words to others. We proclaim this to those we have contact that they might grow in their faith to believers. As he goes on, he also gives some benefit to unbelievers. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, they'll say, you've lost your mind. But if all prophesy, an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all and he is convicted by all. So, if we're all speaking in tongues that nobody understands, the outsider is turned away. They say, you're crazy. And indeed they should. But notice when prophecy is made clear that giving and revealing of what God has revealed to us, it says they will be convinced and they will be convicted because the word of God changes people's hearts. Hebrews chapter 4, 12 makes this clear what is implied in this passage. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's why we have to continue to proclaim as clearly as possible the word of God so that individuals' lives might be brought into fellowship with Jesus Christ. That they would, be understood, they would understand their own sinfulness before a holy God. That they would understand God's love for them in spite of that. In sending Jesus Christ to die for them. That they might have eternal life. See, the, the Corinthians' improper use of tongues had brought about conflict. It brought about confusion. As well as turning away unbelievers. The believers were not built up in the faith as they should have been. So the, the church is weaker. But when we proclaim the word of God and people see us obeying and responding to it, they will testify to God's presence among us. So tongues is for a sign to the unbelievers. Prophecy benefits unbelievers and it benefits believers. But as Paul continued in this passage, he gives us some clear instruction for orderliness in our services. And in their services. See, self-centeredness had brought them to the point that everyone was wanting to do what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. Some of you with kids have watched them to do that, right? Things don't go well at the toy box when that happens, right? They don't go well in a church when that happens either. They were talking and singing over one another so that it was not service or edification, but was glory seeking as they fought to get others' attention and an envied position among others. It's like the kids in the lunch line at school, right? Fighting to who gets lunch first. They wanted to be seen. I want the best gift and I want you to see me do it. So it doesn't matter if you're doing what God has called you to do. If I can get in front of you and do what I want to do, then I will. And that was an attitude that had been conveyed there. And he starts talking about things that would take place in the service. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. A psalm is from the Old Testament and may have been read or sung. Teaching is the teaching of doctrine. But it may have been here because of their attitudes, a pet subject. Something that was their favorite that they continually expounded upon. A revelation was something they claimed that God had given them. Some of them were genuine and some of them were not. Likewise, tongues were genuine human languages that were foreign to the speaker. 
yet others were interrupting with tongues, uh, some legitimate, some counterfeit. And there was a few left giving interpretations. But whatever was to be done in the service, notice verse 26, it was to be for edification, for building up. It was not for self-promotion. It was not for selfishness. It was not for, to glorify myself. It was all for the benefit of the body of Christ to make it stronger in their building. So edification is the building of the body. It's helping individuals become more Christ-like in their lives. It was spiritual edification. It was not a pat on the back and make you feel good about yourself. A lot of people try to do that today, inside and outside the church, but they're not building them up to help them become Christ-like. And this building, as we've seen before in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, it is the responsibility of pastors and leaders as we are to use our gift of preaching and teaching to build others up so you can do the work of the ministry that then you can help build up the rest of the body. Likewise, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, Therefore, comfort each other also, and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Our culture has taken on the world's idea of communication, and they find it funny, and it's used in humor a lot, to tear people down. In whatever way they can. If you have a long nose like me, then you're a bird or something else. You know, they, they come up with all kinds of things. Instead, our words, our gifts are to be used for edification. In their time, besides the counterfeit tongues, these were all acceptable parts of the worship service. But they were not being used in an orderly way, and they therefore were not benefiting the body. So he gives some guidelines for them of using tongues. And as we said, I believe tongues, and I've been teaching that tongues, it has gone off the scene for today. They were still there in the church of Corinth, but as they were still there, they weren't using them right. So he's giving guidelines. And I want to guess that today, if you go to churches that promote speaking in tongues, that you're going to find, I'm going to guess, 80 to 90% of them are not following these rules that are listed here. And therefore you know that they're not biblical. Verses 27 and 28. It says, if anyone speaks a tongue, let there be two or th at the most three, each in turn. And let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. How many times have we heard of those where many people at once are, are speaking gibberish with no interpreters, multiple at a time? Right here, you just see they're disobeying God's word. Because edification was a primary purpose, if there was not interpreter, they were not to speak. There was limiting as well because he's already shown that prophecy is superior. So he limits the number who are allowed to speak because tongues does not edify as much. The whole service was not to be taken up with tongues. Likewise, going on, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Two or three prophets could speak and there's to be people judging the other prophets, the other believers. And is this in agreement with God's word is the question that has to be asked. As one gets up to speak, and we've challenged you that, take what is proclaimed in your Sunday school class and from this pulpit, look at God's word, compare it. We're to be like the Bereans, seeing if these things are so. Are they speaking prophecy that's incorrect? And as they laid the foundation of the church, the teaching had to be clearly evaluated according to God's word. And no one person had absolute authority to speak whatever without being evaluated by others. Paul called the Galatians to do that as well, didn't he? He said, if anyone speaks 
any other gospel than what you've been given before, let him be accursed. He says, if I or an angel bring you anew, let him be accursed. We have to evaluate this, the clarity of God's word. So they were then to yield to one another. If one was speaking and another had a, a, something to share, they had to stop. They were to take turns not speaking at once. This would allow people to learn and to be exalt, exhorted in their Christian walk. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged or exhorted. It was not to be chaos. It was to be clarity in the teaching. Prophets also are to do this judging as they're in submission and control of their spirits. Verse 29, let others judge. Uh, in verse 32, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. As God allows us to minister for him, we are not to step out of our body or have an out-of-body experience. We are to be led of the Spirit of God as our mind and our faculties are all in control with that. So if you see somebody barking like a dog and they claim that that is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you better start questioning. And some of you are looking at me like, what? Do some history on the Pentecostal movement. And there's some revivals out there that were led by barking people. In my lifetime. I know I'm getting old. But the distortion of God's word and the, and the discredit of the spirit of God has been great by some. So out of the spirit and out of the mind, revelations are foreign to the scriptures. See, God did not and does not bypass the minds of men as he reveals truth through them. These principles were put in place because God is a God of peace and not a God of confusion. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. If the church is becoming confusing, not communicating clearly, there's chaos, then something is amiss. You better get back to the word. Now the next phrase, as we, we go into this verse, it says, let the women keep silent in churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's shameful for women to speak in church. I've seen many different uses, various interpretations of this. Fitting contextually, it seems that those who are judging the prophets are not to be the women. Because they would be stepping over the authority of their home, the authority of their husband, and the authority of the leaders of the church. Now they may recognize something, have a question, and they need to ask their husband about it. What unfortunately I've observed in American culture is that a lot of men are lazy when it comes to studying the scriptures. And when the wives have asked them questions, they don't care and they won't do the work to find out. And that is a sad statement for us as men. How many of our men have not been challenged to learn the word of God and then their wives won't ask them? This also goes with Paul's teaching in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Let all women learn in silence with submission. I do not permit women to teach or have authority over men, but to be in silence. These principles are based in verses 13 and 14 of 1 Timothy 2 uh, on God's created order. God created man first, then Eve. And they're also based upon verse 13, that Eve was first deceived. So God's design is that man lead in love and that woman follow in love. 
Now, I've seen this refuted. And, and people say, well, anybody, any one can pastor, women can pastor. Paul had a problem with his mom. And therefore, he had a problem with all women. They take pop psychology and try to apply it to the scripture and twist it. And we have to be careful with that. Because when we start twisting the scripture, it makes it easy to be disobedient. And in these next three verses, Paul gets very strong in saying, we need to follow these principles of orderliness in the church. So even those who may disagree with me that tongues is ceased, you better get back here and check these things out. Because the way you're doing it is in violation. So let's look at these. Final strong statements. Verse 36. Did the word of God come originally for you? Or was it only you that it reached? If you're saved through the power of God's word, you need to submit to God's word. In other words. And there's many ministries today that are not listening to the teaching of God's word regarding tongues. They're not listening to the teaching of God's word regarding women exercising authority over men. So instead of listening to God's word who brought conviction in your life and brought change in your life, you now say, I have greater authority and have greater wisdom than God. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Those who rebel against the organizational teachings of Paul uh, here reveal that they're not prophets submissive to God's word and that they're to be avoided. Look at the following verses. If anyone thinks him to be prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that these things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. These are clear commandments from God. This isn't Paul making up something because he's got a messed up psyche. This is God's design for the church. Is he saying that men are superior to women? He never said that. He said, this is my design for the church. And we're to be doing decently and in order. So it's their clear commands. So God has given his word. We're not greater than his word. These are God's commands, not Paul's ideas, because he's speaking and writing under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Next phrase is just as strong. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's harder to understand in the New King James. But what he's basically saying, if you don't understand these principles, if you're ignorant of how the church is to be performing and holding its services, then you should be regarded as ignorant. In the margin of the New King James, it says, well, if they don't recognize these things, then they should not be recognized. Some of the translations say, if they reject this teaching, they are to be rejected. How many churches and church leaders in Lakeland have disqualified themselves according to this passage and according to that statement? It's a powerful statement. One writing at this says, in verses 37 and 38, Paul gives perhaps his strongest claim to authority as God's apostle. Paul had personal limitations and blind spots, which he freely recognized. But when he spoke for God, his views were not tainted by culture or personal bias. He did not, for instance, teach submission to women in the church because of his Jewish background or in order to conform to any personal male chauvinism. He taught the truth because he himself had so been taught by the Lord. Paul did not claim omniscience, but he claimed unequivocally that everything he taught was about God and his gospel and about his church 
was God's own teaching, the Lord's command. Are we willing to organize and maintain organization within the body of Christ in a way that is obedient to the Lord? And then Paul gives a final challenge as he closes out this chapter. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, do not forbid to speak in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. They were all to seek earnestly prophecy. If they weren't a prophet, then get under the prophecy, the, the proclamation of God's word so that you can be edified. They were to allow tongues. They had not yet ceased in this time. But everything they did was to be done decently and in order. Now God in his word has clearly communicated salvation through Jesus Christ. He in his love sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of sin that each and every one of us who put our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, recognizing that he is Lord because he rose again, we can have eternal life. Have you put your faith in Christ for salvation? That's our remembrance this morning. That's our celebration as we took the Lord's Supper. Likewise, he communicates his goals for the edification and for gifts in the church. He left instructions for how to be orderly within our services. Are you willing to submit? Are you willing to serve others with the gifts that God has given you? Or are you content to just sit back? And take from others. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Recognizing that some of these principles are probably new for some that are here. They're principles that in our culture are not easily received. But yet, if we want to be obedient to you, if we want your blessing upon our lives, if we want your blessing upon the ministry as we proclaim the gospel to the neighborhoods around us, that we need to submit. And we need to submit with the right attitudes. We need to be willing to minister in the ways that you've enabled us, both physically and spiritually. We need to get away from the bondage of selfishness that is so prevalent in our culture that, God, you might use us to do great things. That people's lives might be changed as they hear the proclamation of your word, as they understand the clarity of it and their need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing together today, as we evaluate our own lives. We're going to sing, give of your best to the master. As we think about the gifts he's given us and whether or not we are serving as he desires us to serve. Of your best to the master, give of the strength of your youth, throw your soul's flesh going harder into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example. Dauntless was he young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion. Give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth.
of your best to the master. Give him first place in your heart. Give him first place in your service. Consecrate every part. Given to you shall be given. God, his beloved son, gave. Gratefully seeking to serve him, give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master, give of the strength of your youth, clad in salvation's full armor. Join in the battle for truth. If you need to talk, I'll be right here at the front. One of the deacons will be greeting you at the back door. Remember, we got life groups uh, tonight, tomorrow. They're listed in the bulletin. Encourage you to be connecting with people there, uh, helping to grow in your faith. And Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, we have power to have victory over sin. We have power to help those who are in bondage to sin as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And we just pray that you will give us boldness as we go forth this week, that we might stand up and proclaim the truths that you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.